Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, around the world, countries are procuring hundreds of millions of rapid tests. The WHO procured 120 million, the United States 165 million, France is performing a million tests a week, and Italy now has 30-minute tests at their airport. But on Friday, we learned that this government is blocking Manitoba from being able to procure their own rapid tests. The Prime Minister has been months late on securing rapid tests for Canadians. Why are they now making the provinces go to the back of, of the line as well? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me just begin by congratulating the member opposite on his election as, as leader of the official opposition and to say how pleased I was by his and his wife's recovery from COVID-19. I share uh, the member opposite's view that rapid testing is absolutely essential to our health. It is absolutely essential to our economic recovery. That's why I'm pleased we bought 7.9 million rapid tests last week. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister said rapid tests are essential, but her own minister is sending mixed signals from the federal government. Last month, the Health Minister said that provinces were free to develop and deploy their own rapid tests. Nine days later, the Health Minister told the Government of Manitoba that they could not buy the recently approved Health Canada test. The Health Minister has flip-flopped on the border, on the risks of COVID, on the use of masks, and now on rapid tests. When will the government stop interfering in provincial COVID plans? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, let me say that the Health Minister is a cherished colleague who is doing a fantastic job. When it comes to provinces and the fight against the coronavirus, this is an effort that we must undertake together. That is why over the summer we agreed the Safe Restart Agreement, $19 billion to the provinces to support their fight against coronavirus, and another $2 billion for the Safe Restart of Schools. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, s several regions uh, of our country have to fight with a second wave. We've had to make sacrifices to fight against COVID, but yesterday there were more than 1,000 new cases. If we don't have rapid testing, people have more chance of spreading this virus. The Prime Minister promised quick testing six months ago, and after all this time, we're still wondering how come rapid testing is not ready for the second wave. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, thank you. I agree with the Leader of the Opposition in terms of what Quebec and the provinces are doing, and I support these measures. It's very important, and we have to work with Quebec in terms of rapid testing we purchased 7.9 million rapid tests last week, and the tests will be in Canada next week. Mr. Speaker, they just ordered tests six months after they promised they would. Their slow response is impacting millions of Canadians. In Quebec, it's the long lineups. In Ontario, it's the labs who are stretched to the limit. In Manitoba, it's confusion over buying rapid tests. Mr. Speaker, when is the Prime Minister going to take the health of Canadians seriously and roll out a real plan for rapid testing? Right. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. The Prime Minister, and indeed I believe all members of this House, take the health of Canadians extremely seriously. When it comes to rapid testing, I was very pleased that last week we were able to announce the procurement of 7.9 million rapid tests. Those tests will be in Canada next week, and we will have more to announce about rapid tests very soon. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Canadians and Quebecers know that the Liberal government refused to close borders in time for ideological reasons. The New York Times showed that there was nothing scientific in the idea of keeping the borders open. The Prime Minister preferred to, followed, to follow the WHO's erroneous policies rather than listening to Canadians. How come the Prime Minister did not want to close the border 
when he should have. The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister, if I may, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to correct one small thing. Quebecers are Canadians. With respect to the border, I have to say that I'm very proud of our government's policy, particularly with respect to the border with the United States. We were successful in limiting non-essential travel and, at the same time, trade that is so essential was able to continue. And we're going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, we're in the midst of a second wave in Quebec. More than 1,100 new cases today. It's incredible. And our health system is bu bursting at the seams. And yet, Ottawa is refusing to not increase health transfers to treat Quebecers. They're being stubborn. And this government spent over 30, 300 billion on the pandemic, but only 500 million in health transfers for people during a health crisis. That's 15 cents on every $100 spent. 15 cents for health. When are they going to do their fair share? The Honourable Deputy Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree entirely that the second wave is very serious, and we're taking it seriously. And this is why we reached an agreement on the safe restart, and we're looking at almost $300 billion for Quebec and for the safe recovery. The Honourable for La Prairie. Th these numbers speak for themselves. Qu Quebec and the provinces said they had a shortfall of $28 billion, and they asked for in this into health transfers and they only got 500 million that's what they're asking in health but the provinces and quebec are asking you for more health to treat people and health care workers are asking for more help and what are you waiting for so you can help quebecers to receive care the right honorable uh, the honorable deputy minister mr speaker we understand very well how this serious this situation is. And this is exactly why that we gave Quebec nearly $3 billion for its economic recovery and for health measures. We also helped seniors in Quebec with the Canadian Armed Forces. We were there when Quebec needed us, and we were there always be there for Quebecers. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are clearly in the second wave of the COVID crisis, but the same problems continue. We are afraid for our seniors in long-term health care, and it's hard to have access to COVID-19 testing. So what's the plan for the second wave? What is the plan? to improve access to testing for COVID-19? And what's the plan to help our seniors in long-term care? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, thank you very much for the question. Our plan is to continue to work closely with the provinces, with the territories, and with municipalities. In terms of rapid testing, last week, we purchased 7.9 million rapid tests and and in terms of our approach over the summer for safe restart we set aside 19 million dollars to help provinces and territories thank you mr speaker mr speaker it's clear that we are not headed in the wrong direction the prime minister said quote we're not going in the right direction. But the Prime Minister is the sole person responsible for steering our country in the right direction. But the Prime Minister isn't taking action. Right now, in Ontario, there are 49 outbreaks in long-term care homes where hundreds of seniors are infected with COVID-19. But we know that these problems have existed before. So what is the plan? What is the plan to help our seniors? When will families know that their lo loved ones in long-term care homes are finally safe? Deputy Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I must agree with the leader of the NDP about one thing. We truly are at a crossroads when it comes to COVID-19. The second wave is here right now, particularly acute in Quebec and in Ontario. And each one of us has a responsibility to do everything we can to flatten that curve. When it comes to fighting the coronavirus, we are committed to continuing to work in close collaboration with the provinces, with the territories, with municipalities. It's the Canadian way, and we're going to keep on doing it. The Honourable Deputy de The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. The Canadian way to solve problems is to work together. But unfortunately, in March, when the, during the first wave, the Liberal government dragged its heels on the border issue. We have to recognize this. During the second wave, the Liberal government is still dragging its heels about recognizing rapid testing. 1,200 new cases in Quebec today, and sometimes people have to wait a week for testing results. How come the, the government is still dragging its heels on this file? The Honourable Health Minister. The is, is right. We actually have to work incredibly hard together, provinces, territories and local public health units to fight the second wave, wave of COVID-19. And we know that testing is one aspect of controlling COVID-19. So is a strong contact tracing regime and so is isolation of close contacts. Mr. Speaker, we've been there for provinces and territories, including all Canadians across this country. We'll continue to work with provinces and territories. This is a very, very sneaky virus and we know that all hands on board is what we we need to get through it together. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. There's no results. We're not seeing any. They closed the borders in March, and we're now we're facing rapid testing issues. But in March, there was results. There was testing that was provided results in 15 days. So we there are results. Japan has seen them. How come Canada is dragging its heel heels in terms of rapid testing? of the member opposite is incorrect. We've had rapid testing in Canada for several months. In fact, we have nearly 70 gene expert machines across the country in provinces and territories and rural and remote communities to protect Indigenous communities. And we've continued to add tests as they become available in Canada. In fact, the Abbott test is our third test to approve. That is a rapid test. We'll continue to work with manufacturers, with provinces and territories to be there no matter what it takes. Thank you. The Honourable for Louis Saint Laurent. Well, if everything's going so well, how come Quebec is still waiting? People still have to wait a week to get results. Some people are lucky, can have the results in a few hours. Good for them. But most Canadians can't get results in a reasonable time frame. How come the government has dragged its heels for so long on rapid testing? Ontario in particular are struggling with their testing strategies and with their capacity. We're there, Mr. Speaker, for provinces and territories that need additional help. We have a rapid response program where we go into different jurisdictions to support them, whether it's with contact tracing needs, whether it's with, uh, with, uh, with human resources for long-term care, whether it's with epidemiological expertise. Mr. Speaker, we've been there for provinces and territories. We'll continue to be there for provinces and territories because at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, no matter where a Canadian lives, they deserve excellence in our health care. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Well, the Minister just claimed that there was rapid tests for Canadians, yet Carl Skodstad in Thunder Bay said he had to wait nine days to get his toddler tested. You're, if you're keeping your kid at home for two weeks and you have to stay at home, that's difficult on families and the child's ed education. So she's claiming that there's rapid tests. Carl says there isn't. Who is right? The incompetent health minister or Carl? The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, my heart goes out to Carl because, of course, it's challenging. He's absolutely right when we're waiting for results of tests to determine whether or not we can continue with our life. Mr. Speaker, we've been working very closely with the province of Ontario to help with to deal with the backlog of nearly 78,000 tests or so that they are experiencing. Mr. Speaker, of course, as they refine their testing strategy, we're there with them to provide additional supports in clearing that backlog. Mr. Speaker, we'll be there for Ontarians, including Carl, including all Ontarians across the province to make sure that they get the test that they need when they need it. The Honourable Member for Calgary knows Hill. But that's the point. The government hasn't been there for Carl. And in fact, in Thunder Bay, Dr. Stuart Kennedy 
the physician leading up the COVID-19 response at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center says that the turnaround time test for COVID-19 is problematic. It's because they don't have access to rapid tests. That's this minister's job. And if she can't even do the job in her own backyard, what's, what hope does the rest of Canada have? When are we going to have access to rapid tests? Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I speak with Dr. Kennedy every single week on the situation in Thunder Bay, and so I'm excited that the member opposite knows so much about my own home community. I gladly include her in briefings with the department if she wishes to take me up on understanding the challenges that Ontario is facing, including on testing capacity. In fact, in, in Thunder Bay, they have the capacity to do 300 lab tests, but the rest, they don't have the capacity to process. So we're going to be there for Ontario, Mr. Speaker, along with all other provinces and territories as they continue to work through testing strategies that make sense and that will work for all Canadians. Thank you. Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. If only there was some way to rapidly test people in Canada, let's say at home, using tests that have been approved around the world that other countries have, maybe we could have more, more access to tests. The minister fundamentally doesn't understand this. She sat on her thumbs for months. Carl her head of her hospital, they're telling her this and she's like, yeah, this is great, it's fine. This government is incompetent and it's killing people. There are people that can't see their loved ones, they can't go to work because of the lack of rapid tests. And they sit here and try and sell us that it's okay. When are we getting rapid tests? The Honourable Minister. for the member opposite to be fully briefed by my department on what a comprehensive testing strategy looks like because clearly when she indicates that perhaps people could test themselves at home and that would solve our problem, she's uh, indicating a lack of awareness that in fact once people receive the test, something has to be done with that test, Mr. Speaker, and that's where the real work begins with public health and the terms of contact tracing and isolation of close contacts. Mr. Speaker, I'm on the ground every single week talking to public health units at local levels to understand what their challenges are, and I certainly invite her to take the briefing at her convenience. The Honourable Member for St. Hyacinthe Bagot. Mr. Speaker, small businesses such as restaurants and bar survived the first wave of COVID by going into debt, but this is no longer an option. Loans aren't enough. If we want to avoid thousands of bankruptcies during the second wave, we have to help companies pay their fixed costs. Quebec has established a forgivable financial aid for fixed costs and is acting auto asking Ottawa to participate. Since April, the Bloc has been asking Ottawa for help with fixed costs. Quebec has taken action, but what is the federal government waiting for? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, which is a very important one. In the th speech from the th throne, we promised help for SMEs to pay their fixed costs. And this is more important than ever as we are in the second wave of COVID and provinces and Quebec have taken strong measures to face this. So we really have to be there and we will be. The Honourable Member for Cynthia saint pagot Mr. Speaker, what the government announced Friday was more loans, but there are limits to how much debt bars and restaurants can take on. We have reached the limit of what we can carry forward in the throne speech, the government promised to help companies who have to shut their doors for public health reasons. When will they finally walk the talk? Will Ottawa join the Quebec government and offer support for fixed costs for businesses in red zones? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. The answer is yes. And I've discussed this issue with Eric Girard yesterday evening. I am going to speak to him again this evening, and I have a question for the Bloc. When we've wor done the technical work on this, I hope the Bloc will vote in favour of it. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, few sectors have suffered as much from COVID as the cultural industry. Life was just getting back when theatres and cinemas were once again closed. Our artists are now in lockdown again, and they're worried. Quebec has announced assistant assistance for ticket income in the throne speech. Ottawa has committed 
to specific support for the cultural sector aside from the CERB and the wage subsidy because we know it's not enough to save, save this industry. Well, it says that it will affect, provide support for other industries such as tourism. But current programs aren't enough. What is Ottawa waiting to announce something? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. We're also very concerned by the situation in the arts and cultural sector. That's why our government has provided $4 billion in assistance for this sector to get through this very serious crisis, including 500000 in emergency funding and $50 million last week so that um, filming for TV and films can resume in Quebec and will always be there for the arts and cultural sector. Thank you very much. The Honourable for Charbourg, au Saint-Charles. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The arrogance of the Liberal Party starts at the top and is trickling down to its MPs. We've we want this government to prioritize rapid testing. But instead of taking responsibility for their inaction, they're blaming others. Last week, the member for Gatineau attacked officials at Udway Health by saying that often in the Udway region, health decisions are made that leave people puzzled. Will the Prime Minister call him to order and ask him to apologize? The Honourable Minister for Health. It's important that we understand, all of us in this House, that every public health official, every health care worker, every person in our health care systems across the country at local, provincial and federal levels are working flat out to protect Canadians' health. I think that in this side of the House, and certainly I would hope it, all of us understand that we owe a debt of gratitude to these hardworking professionals who, in many cases, have not slept for months. The Honourable for Charlebourg au Saint-Charles. Yes, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly why the comments made by the member for Gatineau are shameful. At a time when we should be grateful to our health care professionals, the Liberals are attacking them. Many of our health care workers are tired, overworked and need support. But instead, the member for Gatineau has chosen to insult health care workers by questioning their supply strategies and their management abilities. Will the, will the member rise in this House and apologize for his paternalistic attitude, yes or no? Speaker, I think I can say that all of us have a profound respect for the work of health care workers all across this country, regardless of which, which area they're, they're working in. Mr. Speaker, we know that we can't get through this without our health care workers. And furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we know that people are learning every single day about this virus, how to manage it, how to contain it, how to deal with the second wave. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that knows that when it gets hard, we roll up our sleeves and we work even harder. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, on Saint Charles. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can we explain why the Gatineau Hospital bought a cutting edge rapid testing machine for COVID? And the Minister of Quebec told me that we have a Ferrari in the garage, but we're just waiting for permission to use it. So, what is the federal government waiting to give Ottawa Health Centre the green light? The Honourable Health Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm, aware, I'm unaware of the uh, particular testing device that uh, the member is speaking about, but I will certainly dig in and find out exactly what the delay is and uh, what kind of equipment that they are waiting for. Thank you. Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Local businesses in Edmonton have been hit hard by COVID. Instead of helping small businesses like Fred's Truck Outfitters, this government laid out a flawed rent assistance program that didn't do the job. And now that the Liberals have ended the program without replacing it, Fred and other business owners are left scrambling to stay open as a second wave hits. Small businesses create jobs and contribute to our communities and the country. When will the Prime Minister stand up for small businesses and support them into the second wave. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, I'd like to thank the member from Edmonton Strathcona for that really important question and personally I love the small businesses of Edmonton Strathcona in particular. Uh, in the speech from the throne we committed to extending SEBA to support small businesses across the country and to supporting small businesses with their fixed costs, including rent. That is something that we are working on right now with the provinces and with the municipalities. Small businesses do need our continued support and we're going to be there for them. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. 
A damning report released today says that the, the decisions made by the Public Health Agency of Canada put healthcare workers at risk because unlike other countries, it failed to learn lessons from SARS. Canada's infection rate for healthcare workers is twice that of the global rate. The nurses' union has not been properly consulted. Some nurses were denied N95 masks, and the safety needs for long-term care homes were ignored. The president of the PHAC stepped down only after eight 18 months and now this. Does the minister accept any responsibility or is she just going to point fingers again? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, I accepted full responsibility and insisted that the union, uh, CFNU, the Canadian Federation of Nurses Union, was at the table as guidance continued to be developed for the appropriate use of personal protective equipment in hospital and clinical settings. In fact, the CFNU was included in those guidance uh, documents. Their, their, their suggestions were included and updated guidance was released. And we will continue to work with unions who protect the health and safety of workers across this country. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, in Halifax West and across Nova Scotia, we're seeing a concerning decline in housing affordability. The government's taken important steps to help Canadians find an affordable place to call home with the National Housing Strategy, which has had a real impact for communities across Canada. Still, many Nova Scotians are concerned about paying rent. Could the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development please provide an update to the House on the measures being taken to make rent more affordable? The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Thank my Honourable colleague from Halifax West for his question and his, his strong advocacy on behalf of his constituents and on housing issues in general. We know that people in Nova Scotia and across the country have been worried about making ends meet during these challenging times. That's why I am so pleased that last week we were able to launch the Canada Nova Scotia targeted housing benefit, which will provide up to 6,100 households in the province with an average of over $200 a month to help cover the cost of housing. This is real help going directly into the pockets of Nova Scotians. And this is another example of the national housing strategy at work, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Carleton. Thank you. Germany, the UK and Japan are also dealing with COVID-19, but their unemployment rate is half ours here in Canada. Not only do we have double the unemployment rate as of those three countries. We also have the highest unemployment rate in the G7, 3% higher than the OECD. We have the worst, the worst record, jobs record here in Canada among the entire G7. And it's because of this government's policies. Will this government do away with its anti-employment policies to allow Canadians to get back to work? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives do not want to admit it, but our economic policy is working for workers. You don't have to take my word for it. I quote, Canada is ahead of the United States in terms of job levels. Two-thirds of lost jobs have been recovered by August, and it's only 55 percent in the U.S. And I think, I believe, the U.S. is a G7 country. Crisis with a much higher unemployment rate than the United States of America because of the anti-job policies of this government. And right now, today, this country has higher unemployment than the U.S., the U.K., Japan. Germany, Italy, France, three percentage points higher than across the OECD. That is the result of a failed jobs policy here in Canada. When will this government get out of the way so that Canada gets out of last place? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would just like to remind the member for Carleton that going into this crisis, Canada had the lowest unemployment rate we have had in 40 years. And I believe that there were a few Conservative governments during that period. They didn't hit our record. Now, when it comes to international comparison, I think the better 
metric is labor force participation. Canada is at 78.5%. Australia is only at 77.5%. The US at 73%, at South Korea at 62.1%. We're higher than all of those countries, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Over the weekend, a gangland shooting occurred where the targets were connected to an international money laundering syndicate. Now, these individuals are linked to the Chinese Communist Party efforts to interfere in Canadian politics and disrupt this country's institutions. These same people have rubbed shoulders with well-known Liberals, including former MP Joe Pescasolito, former Minister Raymond Chan, former Liberal Party insider Michael Ching. When will these Liberals tell temper their affection for the Chinese Communist Party and protect Canada's democracy. The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and let me be very clear that our government is actually quite firm in dealing with individuals who are attempting to hide their money in Canada and on organized crime. And I would simply remind the member opposite then in their last four years in office, they slashed the budget of law enforcement uh, by over half a billion dollars. They closed 12 integrated proceeds of crime unit. And so tough talk about crime and organized crime and protecting Canadians was backed up by very weak action. And Mr. Speaker, we're reversing the cuts and the slashes that they've made, and we're restoring the capacity of our law enforcement agencies to keep us safe. The Honourable Mr. Minister for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, it's clear that cozying up with the Chinese Communist Party comes with serious consequences. And Joe Pescasolito, whose ethical violation these Liberals tried to cover up in this House last week, is one of the Liberals connected with the incident. Many of the individuals pictured with these senior Liberals have ties to the United Front, an organization that Beijing has been using to suppress pro-democracy rallies in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. The Liberals have had these ties for years. When will the Prime Minister finally condemn those who are actively trying to undermine democracy here and in Hong Kong? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to dealing with China, Mr. Speaker. We were the first country in the world to suspend our extradition treaty with Hong Kong, Mr. Speaker. We suspended the export of sensitive equipment to Hong Kong, Mr. Speaker. We're going to announce measure on immigration with respect to Hong Kong, Mr. Speaker. At every step of the way, we have fought for human rights. We're standing up for the people of Hong Kong and the 300,000 Canadians who live in Hong Kong. Uh, order. <laughs> I just want to remind the honourable members, usually when the speaker stands, it means everybody stay quiet. Thank you. And I just want to remind the honourable members that I heard some words, I kind of know where it came from, but be careful on the parliamentary language that you're using. Calling someone else a name is not something that we encourage in the House. Actually, we uh, discourage it. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Mr. Speaker, the Quebec government had to shut down restaurants and bars. The next day, they announced support for restaurants and bars. The Quebec government also had to shut down theatres. The next day, they announced support for theatres. The government of Canada had to shut down airports. Six months later, still no help for them. While the transport minister is mulling things over, other countries are supporting their airlines. When's he going to do something? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. I'd like to reassure him we are working very hard to find assistance for the airlines in Canada. We know they've been hard hit by this pandemic, and I assure you, this is a priority to this government to find solutions to ensure that the airlines are on a sound footing when the economy bounces back. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. It's been a long wait, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, with the borders closed, it was going to be tough for the airlines. They've lost 90% of their sales volume. It's tragic, but still no help from Ottawa. The U.S., for example, has committed $20 billion for airports alone. 
All this government has done is give Montreal and Quebec City airports a rent holiday, nothing at all for the regions. The airlines are crucial to the economy. 70,000 jobs are at stake. That's over 70,000 families waiting. Mr. Speaker, when is the minister going to do something? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, as we said, this is a priority for us. And it was in the throne speech we clearly undertook to help the regions because the regions have to be served just like every other part of the country. We acknowledge that it's important to do this. It is part of the solution. And we are working on the big picture solution. And once we have something to say, we will say it. Prince George. Uh, the Honourable Member for Caribou Prince George, I believe, is on mute. Uh... Mr. Speaker, can you there hear me now? There we go. You're on. Mr. Speaker, Mental Illness Awareness Week is designed to open the eyes of all Canadians to the reality of mental illness. It's incumbent on all of us as leaders of our great country to commit to doing better, being better when it comes to understanding the very real impact of mental illness and injury. Last week, the Minister of Employment made a snide comment about having PTSD as it related to the Phoenix pay system. It's comments like this that further stigmatize and minimizes the impact mental illness and injury have on those suffering in the shadows. Will the Minister apologize to the thousands of Canadians Canadians fighting mental illness and injury for this ridiculous comment. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can say uh, that on this side of the House, all members understand that far too many Canadians are living under the shadows of mental illness, and certainly my heart goes out to them and their families. That's why at the beginning of the pandemic, we added an additional $500 million in direct transfers to provinces and territories to boost up capacity to deal with mental illness. We've also started uh, launched the wellnesstogether.ca portal at the very beginning stages of the pandemic. I encourage all Canadians to check out this free resource where they can gain access to professionals that can help them in this time of need. Honourable Member for Caribou Prince George. So the Minister of Employment will not apologize. Mr. Speaker, too many Canadians are struggling with mental illness in silence. Extended periods of isolation and quarantine has led to increased anxiety, stress, substance abuse, domestic violence, and suicide. COVID has pushed those already suffering further into the shadows. Mental health is a cornerstone of public health, and it's critical to our nation's recovery. There is no health without mental health. Canadians need a plan to address this mental health crisis before we go forward. Two go forward. Where's the plan, Mr. Speaker? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And all along the way, uh, before the pandemic and, inc and including after the pandemic, we've been there for provinces and territories to increase their capacity to support people, Canadians who are living with mental illness, and to improve the mental wellness of all Canadians. And I encourage the member opposite to take a look at the wellnesstogether.ca portal, which adds a federal uh, support to the pro work that provinces and territories are conducting. Mr. Speaker, it is very important that we all have these open and honest conversations about mental illness and wellness in our own personal lives and in our communities. We must break the stigma. We must help people seek help. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, last December, the Environment Minister declined to order an impact assessment of the Bighorn Mine outside of Hinton, saying it would be dealt with by, approval, by provincial approval. But on July 30th, ministerial discretion was used to designate the Vista Mine expansion to be under federal review. Mr. Speaker, when will this government finally admit they don't want any form of natural extraction in Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for his question. Uh, he couldn't be farther from the truth, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we have and continue to support our energy sector workers. Just during this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, we invested over $1.7 billion to help clean up abandoned uh, oil wells. Uh, we invested $750 million to support the efforts uh, in the oil sector to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've put in place measures to support the workers, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to support all Canadians, regardless what sector they're in, we're, we're, regardless what sector they're in, excuse me, we're going to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Brampton East. 
Mr. Speaker, the residents of Brampton East were thrilled to hear about the recent $45 million transit investment made by our federal government, which is one of the largest investments in Brampton Transit in over 10 years. This funding will allow for increased reliability for riders, add capacity while providing cleaner transit options for the wonderful residents in Brampton. Can the Minister of Infrastructure or Parliamentary Secretary please provide insight into our government's plan for clean transit solutions across the country? The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Brampton East for this question and for all of his hard work on behalf of his constituents. Mr. Speaker, we're committed to investing in communities as we build back better from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our Investing in Canada plan means new electric buses, new subways, new bike lanes, new multi-use paths, and we'll continue to invest in public transit and active transportation to help Canadians get to work, back to home, and to their families, safely and quickly while creating good jobs, economic growth, and promoting environmentally friendly transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very good. The Honourable uh, Member for uh, Port Moody, Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, the Tri-City COVID-19 testing clinic was run by 10 doctors who gave up their spare time. It was the only clinic in my community, and sadly, their doors closed on October 2nd. The doctors were burning out. Other countries have had rapid testing for months, but the Liberal government has delayed procuring rapid testing devices, and recently approved Abbott ID now may not arrive in sufficient amounts for months. Will the Prime Minister admit that his failure at rapid tests has caused the clinic in my community to close? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think the member opposite's story illustrates why we owe health care workers such a debt of gratitude just during this incredibly demanding time. In fact, all across the country, health care workers are tired. They are exhausted, including public health care workers who are doing the hard work of contact tracing and helping people to isolate. Mr. Speaker, we have accelerated access to rapid testing. In fact, this is the Abbott, the Abbott test is the third rapid test that we've approved. We've had almost 70 gene experts around the country in rural and remote communities for a long time, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to work with all kinds of different uh, test manufacturers to make sure that we have the blend of tools we need. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Leeds-Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, Mr. Speaker, just a minute ago, the Foreign Affairs Minister said that nobody's going to be tougher on China than they are. Well, that's not what he told Chinese state media. Let me quote, and I would say China stands out as a beacon of stability, predictability, a rule-based system, a very inclusive society, close quote. That's this Foreign Minister. He's saying one thing to Canadians wow. and another thing to Chinese state-owned media. So my question through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Foreign Minister is, when is he, when is this Liberal government going to temper their affection for the Chinese Communist Party and start putting the interests of this country, of Canadians, first. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy that the member allows me to talk about the leadership we have done around the world when it comes to the Chinese issue, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the member knows very well when I was referring to that, and Canadians at home understand that the beacon of stability, predictability, and rule of law is Canada, Mr. Speaker. Everyone in Canada understands and around the world. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we can take a stance in the world, talk for human rights, defend the people of Hong Kong, speak with the Uyghur, speak for the Tibetans. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, at every opportunity. The Honourable Member for Medicine Hudson. Medicine Head Carson Warner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All Western Canadians, including our Premiers, want to be equal partners in Confederation. Canada's economic recovery plan must be inclusive by considering and respecting the wealth of all provinces, including their natural resources. At a time, Mr. Speaker, when our country so desperately needs to come together, the divisive attitude and actions of the Prime Minister and his government are very disturbing. When will the Prime Minister stop his childish mocking of the concerns of Western Canada and finally begin to address our needs? Here, here. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government has for many months worked collaboratively with Western Premiers and indeed Premiers across the country to meet the economic and public health needs of their citizens. I had a conversation with the Premier of Alberta, for example, a few days ago. Very constructive, very positive conversation about what we can do together to support the people of Alberta and to work together to help Canadians in the economic crisis and the public health crisis that all Canadians face. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Brampton North. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout the pandemic, the government has made it a priority to support Indigenous communities, which has helped contain the spread of COVID-19 and keep people safe. Our government has committed to walk the path of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and has been focused on implementing commitments made in 2019. Can the Minister of Justice please update the House on our commitment on, to introduce the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Brampton North for her tireless efforts on behalf of Indigenous peoples and the reconciliation process. Our government is committed to advancing the rights of First Nations, Inuit and Métis across the country as we walk the path of reconciliation together. As part of that work, we have committed to introducing legislation to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples by the end of 2020. We have been working closely with national Indigenous organizations on a path forward that is adapted to the new circumstances imposed by the pandemic while collaborating with Indigenous partners and rights holders on the development of the legislation. We look forward to having more to share soon. Member for North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, yesterday vigils were held across the country to honour, remember and demand justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Indigenous women in my riding, frustrated by the inaction of this government, started the Little Red Dress Project to raise money to put up billboards with names and faces of a missing Indigenous women and girls across Vancouver Island. Mr. Speaker, is this what it has come to? Fundraising to save lives? What will it take for this government to move past empty words and actually help to save the lives of Indigenous women and girls in this country? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I share the concern of the member and I, I too participated yesterday on October 4th as we honour the lives of those that have gone missing and support the families of, of the MMIWG2S uh, and gender diverse people across this country. Our government is determined to, to work with all provinces and territories in responding to the first ever national inquiry to make sure that the families can seek justice, re re receive support, and that we will put in the concrete actions to stop this national tragedy. Honourable member for Vancouver Grenville. Canadians are horrified by the racism witnessed during the tragic death of Joyce Etiquan. Of course, racism is, racism is not new. Indigenous peoples, even those in this chamber, including myself, have experienced racism throughout the history of Canada. Racism occurs in all sectors of society, including governments and political parties. This must change. To the minister, do you agree that not nearly enough has been done by your government to combat Indigenous-specific racism? Assuming you do, what new concrete and specific actions will you take to combat it? Will you call it out always and not only when it reaches the front pages? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This traumatizing and dehumanizing event that occurred in the death of Joyce Echequan was an expression of the absolute worst face of racism. Systemic racism in our healthcare system is a national problem, and we must face the reality that our institutions continue to fail Indigenous peoples. It's essential that there be a timely, transparent investigation. We welcome Quebec's dec decision to act swiftly on the inquest. We know that this is not limited to the healthcare system and, and expresses itself across all institutions of government. And while much has been done in the last five years, much more remains and we'll continue to work on it diligently and call it out wherever it occurs. I thank the member for her question. That's all the time we have for questions today. C'est tout le temps qu'on a.